Hello and welcome to the Endurance Podcast with myself, Alex Rhodes, and Dr. Tim Podloga. How are we doing, Tim? Hey, um, doing good, thanks. Um, just about to move down south, actually, this weekend for the final time from Birmingham. So, Ooh. yeah, exciting times ahead. Nice. So, moving down to, to warmer climates. Um, but I kind of, I was going to make a purpose of not even talking about the weather this week because <laughs> I have absolutely no idea what's going on anymore. Um, so, I think we should just bypass that. Um, but you're moving down to Exeter University? Yes. Um, mostly because they have better climbs. <laughs> well, that's perfect for what we're gonna <laughs> what we're gonna talk about today. But I do have some uh, some important, very exciting news, actually. But this is probably only for me and you because we love coffee. Um, but I actually went and bought the. Have you seen the Flare Fifty Eight, which is a manual lever uh, espresso? Oh, yeah, probably James Hoffman reviewed it at some point. Yeah, yeah, most likely. Um, I, I bought one of those the other week, and I am just in this black hole of coffee making now because it's not only dialing it in with, with your grind and, you know, semi-automatic, you've then got pressure profiles. But what I will say is when you do get it right, it is amazing. <laughs> but I mean, I've just got lost now. <laughs> it's like... You just spend so much time, like just on coffee. I mean, some this is like a bit amazing. Um, I just can't imagine doing myself that. Um, although I kind of am a bit meticulous when it comes to coffee, but not. I think it's. Way. I think it's actually my escape because we're very busy with lots of other things, um, and it's kind of just my little quiet time to. And like like yourself, I kind of like the process of things and learning and and doing that. So it's definitely like escalated in in my uh, in my coffee drinking. But and I have to limit myself now because it's like I will pour two shot two double shots in a morning. And I'm like I really want another one, but I, yeah, I need to leave that alone. Um, but we kind of get into the end of certainly what the European cycling season is now. Um, you know, the Vuelta finished um, a couple of weeks ago, which was a, was a great race. We've got um, the Ironman Worlds um, coming up. So we've got the female race out in Nice uh, coming this weekend and then and then the men's um, following on from that out in Kona. Um, but a more exciting event that is going to be coming up soon in October is the British Hill Climb. So Today we're going to talk about hill climbing, um, and I suppose for the listeners, this is kind of where I wanted to to get your input. Um, for the listeners, a, a hill climb is, in very simplistic terms, a race, a time trial from the bottom of a hill to the top of the hill. Um, it's a pretty horrendous experience, and um, certainly the hills in the UK uh, last. Oh, we're probably talking three to seven minutes eight minutes at best pretty savage in terms of gradients and road surface um i a question that i had for you is this is this purely a british thing or or you know have you experienced this back in slovenia anywhere else in europe well i think every country has these like uphill competitions it just depends on what type of climbs they have there because in Slovenia yeah you have like probably races that are like on the climbs that I don't know take 25 minutes all the way to like 30 40 minutes I guess um, but yeah in the UK basically you don't have those climbs so you need to be happy with climbs that are three minutes long <laughs> but that you know that really that really does change things though doesn't it because you know 20 30 minutes is very much you know i'm not saying this is black and white because we know uh, you know physiological response works on a continuum but pay you know the physiological response for something that's 20 30 minutes long is going to be quite drastically different to that three to seven minutes yeah it's going to hurt by the end of it but not in a similar way to to what that happens on such a short climb and i think that leads on to what i really want to delve into is is the nutrition 
for such an event and, and some of that preparation. But from a physiological response, you know, beyond that three minutes, we're really going to be maximal aerobic capacity, you know, high rates of glycolysis, so breakdown of glycogen, um, lactate accumulation, which, you know, really depends on the body's ability to be able to buffer that and shuttle it into the mitochondria. Um, But I think also something with me mentioning that always rings the bell, actually, is to um, make a point that, that lactate production it's not the cause of fatigue. We see it loads in, uh, you know, in the media and um, and the response, but more so the metabolites associated with it um, that can change things there and have an association with the fatigue that we that we feel. Um, so, like, would you say that that was was pretty accurate for those short type events? Yeah, because like I was just before this chart, like I was comparing the this year's hill climb course in the uk so the national champions and like the expected duration is going to be around three minutes for the winner i think the current km is just over three minutes so i imagine they will um, go lower than that and then i compare this to like an event in austria that i really want to do which is like glockner kinnick ultra which is basically like a mountain like an uphill um until like the top of the uh, Grossglockner Hochalpenstrasse, which is kind of, I think it's like 200, 2,600 or something meters above the sea level. And the record, course record is around one hour, 23 minutes, <laughs> I think. And like, <coughs> it's a massive difference. And like, there's so many things that like basically physiologically change between those two durations. So when you're talking about one hour, 23 minutes, you're talking about, you know, like we say, okay, functional threshold power, which is the power you can sustain for, let's say, one hour. But then when we're talking about lactate threshold, so the second lactate threshold and critical power, usually the time to fatigue at those intensities is actually much lower than one hour. Um, So I don't know, we're talking about like 30, 40 minutes. Yeah. So this is way longer than that. And we are basically talking about half marathon um this like type of an event which is completely different than like yeah runs that last like four minutes or three minutes physiologically like you have completely different types of athletes winning one event and the other um yeah. and very similarly this is the case here but one thing that also we need to consider and changes in cycling but not for instance in running is the if, um, effect of the altitude because when you start the race at i don't know 500 meters sea level and finish at 2700 you get a massive effect of also like yeah the altitude and the lower amount of oxygen up there um, and this you need to take in account when you're like preparing for the um, actual event whereas like when it's two or three minutes you don't get really high up especially not in the uk so there are like so many things to consider um and sometimes i feel like he's a good climber doesn't mean much because well you need to kind of specify what kind of climbs he's good at because definitely we can't expect the same person to be the best like in all conditions and i see we see this like in world tour cycling where some riders are really good at really long climbs and some riders are better at shorter climbs but then we just like put them all into one basket and say well he just didn't perform today but no it was just like perhaps it was not his climb or vice versa so it's and and you know like i know some of the things that you've done yourself in the past um from a from a hill climb perspective um or or kom challenges but you know these events are so precise and meticulous to an extent that you know we're going to talk about nutrition and and things that can help us with that but even on a three four five minute climb the pacing of that you know power to weight ratio is you know critical to this type of event 
but the pacing of that is also so critical because you know i there are slight undulations if you look at this year's hill climb average is 10 percent, but there's bits of 13 there's there's little kicks there people ride these people some people from a weight perspective um and we'll get onto bikes in a minute you know single chain ring single cog uh, and and they can understand when i can sit down when i can get out of the saddle what's most effective which part of the road to ride how do i pace that um because i come i personally come from um i was a very good sprinter when i was younger and i've transitioned over the years to more endurance type sports uh, which actually probably helps me with things like mountain bike race starts um just to blow all my, uh, you know, bl- burn all my matches in the first 30 seconds. But, you know, it seems short for three, four minutes, but we can go so wrong at times if, you know, I, I think myself, I could burn all my matches in the first minute if I'm not too careful. Um, and so these people who do this are, are just so precise. They They ride these things. The bikes are amazing. Um, you know, these Frankenstein bikes with no UCI limit. We've got chopped off handlebars, single rear chain rings. Um, some go single speed if they can keep the cadence. Um, you know, a whisper of carbon for the seat. And we're talking like five kilo bikes here. So it's a fascinating kind of technological thing. But to try and advance on that, improve that power to weight ratio is is really important there. Um, but I imagine, you know, then when we go to the longer climbs like that, you know, comfort, gear selection, all these kind of things are just going to be so vastly different. So I think it's a very unique thing that we we see here. And it's really interesting to, to chat about this. Um, and I know that you've had some some experience of this over here. So like, why did you, you know, choose to do this over here? And, and like, what was your experience like? Well, I, I'm not really good at bike handling, so I never really wanted to enter like mass start races. Um, I've done a few over the years, some Grand Fondos, but this was like limited to one a year. But I really enjoyed like just going all the way, all out on the climbs. Um, I've always enjoyed doing that. And whenever I go somewhere, I just do that. Um, so when I came to the UK in 2021 for my postdoc, it was like a natural thing to try out the national hill climb championships. I had plenty of time at the time and I was like, it was just like, let's go for it. I need this experience. Um, and it was like a massive difference to the climb that I was doing previously in Slovenia, which were like 12 minutes or more, um, or even in like in Italy or Austria, when I was doing the climbs that were like more than an hour long. Um, at first it seems like, oh, it's similar, but it's not like just, getting the from physiological perspective i think like warm up becomes super important like you don't do a warm up when you go up the stelvio for one hour 30 or whatever <laughs> you warm but up on you the need, way you need to do a warm up before you go up i don't know a snake snake pass or yeah. whichever um climb out there so like these kind of things like actually excite me because as a physiologist and nutritionist, like I need to study them and like think about what nutrition protocol and what what to do about it. So I kind of found it really exciting. Um, in the end, I completely blew up on the on the race um, that <laughs> year. Um, it was raining cats and dogs. Um, it was super cold. Um, there were crowds that yeah overinflated my pace at the start. Uh, so <laughs> basically, the pacing was shit. <laughs> um my tire was sleeping i had a brand new tire on the bike and it was just didn't hold anything so i was just like going into, like yeah couldn't do any out of the saddle cycling um er- anything anyway it was a disaster for me that year but it was kind of exciting to go through and think about everything yeah related to performance in these uh, and, it, and it is a fine line like i you know i i've limited experience but i have done some hill climbs around here and you know like you're saying uh, once you go over that limit and you realize you've gone over that limit one it's too late but two you still have to climb 
like you're not at the end you can't freewheel you can't sit up you 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 know under the laws of gravity and you know i think i was conservative when the first hill climb i did i was conservative and i was like i know i've just got to be careful we were like eight nine percent kicked up in a few places and i was like i can't go too hard before that kick and i backed off but still i went way over and i was maybe like four five hundred meters from the top and the wave just came over me i was like i am I'm struggling here and i just like need to turn the pedals and get just get to the end of this and and when it's so short you know the margins between between winning and not being as successful are a matter of seconds you know so that some of these things really play a part and as we're probably going to find out some of you know nutritional influences can really play a part in in that as well um if you were to go back to that and do it differently, what, what would you do? Well, definitely. I, I, I went to the, the, the climb alone. Like that year was like, yeah, I was alone there. Like it was raining. The rain was the biggest problem for me. I just wasn't used to, yeah, didn't expect that. It was freezing cold and yeah, the warm up was not proper because like I was freezing during the warm up. And I think like it was just like, yeah, really bad. But the other races I did that year, um, which were much, much nicer, and most of the climbs were longer, actually. Um, I actually, I think I won a couple um, and then, yeah, did a few other, like, podium places um, because I needed to qualify for the Nationals. So I was probably one of the, like, yeah, kind of almost the favorites for the Nationals, but then I completely blew up. <laughs> um, it was also probably not the climb that like suit me well because it was uh, Winnet's pass and it was like, like three minutes or something. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I'm better at like eight minutes, 10 minute climbs. But what I would do differently, like nutrition on the last day because I was so nervous was not perfect. Um, and yeah, the warm up was definitely like, but you needed like a indoor uh, trainer and then like, a, I don't know, an umbrella and just, um yeah do the warm up there which is what the winners were doing i think yeah. under feather and um tom bell at the time um and just like these kind of details and then the bike well it was kind of light but not super light um but yeah you can go like and obsess about this three minute event these, um, for as these much bikes as you, want. you can't even ride on the normal roads <laughs> they're like purely for hill climbing yeah um yeah, I bought an, uh, a saddle from AliExpress. I just put it on for that day and then took it off and just like, you know, just, <laughs> yeah, these kind of modifications you do. But then interestingly, like, interestingly, the rules are like kind of funny because you need a hand, a, a light on the back and on the, uh, on the front yeah. and now a helmet, but then it doesn't really matter if your brakes are actually doing anything. Because I remember going down the Winnet's Pass, I really struggled to pray because I had carbon rim brake bike and it was just like not braking whatsoever. Do, um, we, do we have to, I mean, this is my, you know, absence of, of knowledge there. Do we have to wear helmets now? Because for yeah. a long time you didn't have to. Yeah, it was the last year without the helmets in 2021. Ah, okay. um, and that year, actually, Tom Bell one and he was wearing a helmet during the actual attempt so yeah it's not a massive difference you can't lose an i mean I, I think we should wear helmets all the time but anyway. yeah it was really weird when i was not wearing it especially <laughs> when you go down like it feels like something is wrong you know yeah but it's just like yeah everyone does it so let, let's just do it without helmets and would you would you do it again? Like, did you was the atmosphere good? Did you enjoy that? I know you've done some bigger races in Europe, but you know, was it a, was it quite unique in in its in its way? Well, yeah, like because there's a funny thing. Like, if you do an event in like Europe and it's like the climb is like one hour and a half long, you will never get the same number of spectators there. Whereas, like here, like on a three minute climb, like across the whole climb there are spectators <laughs> cheering for people and it's pretty amazing because i think this is how actually this on the 
like Vuelta or Tour de France or like those events for the whole climb on those, yeah, yeah. the most important climbs. And this is how you kind of get an idea of how these riders are actually feeling. And it's kind of really, am it's, it's an amazing feeling because I remember I overpaced, as I mentioned earlier. So the climb was like, I don't know, three minutes long. Overpaced at the start. And I think last minute, I had no idea what was going on up <laughs> around me. I just hear, heard the noises of the bells and people shouting at me. And this is the only thing that was keeping me like upright because otherwise I would just like completely like stop and get off the bike and like crash on the floor. Um, and when you get to the finish line, there are people actually there prepared to like hold you because otherwise you would just like crash onto the floor. Um, and you can't recreate this on a training ride, even though if you want to do a KIM attempt or something, it's just like an amazing feeling. And it's really like a great experience. <laughs> Cool. Um, so, I mean, let, let's get down to talking nutrition wise for this, because my view for this type of event is that there's two sides to this. We've got the preparation from a whole food perspective, you know, what we're eating before, what we're going to eat in preparation of it and fueling for that type of event. And then we've got the, the erg ergogenic aid side of things. So we've got bicarb, um, beta alanine, caffeine that we can introduce there as um, well, certainly bicarb and, and beta alanine as, as intra and extracellular buffers. Um, and we can go into that, but let's start with kind of the whole food perspective. What, what would we consider eating um, in, in the, in the day, day or days prior and the morning of, if we're considering things, you know, like um, glycogen um, loading, but we do have to consider that power to weight ratio as well. What would you advise would be a good approach to that? So I think like it really depends on the type of the climb. So let's like talk about the whole spectrum now. Yeah. I think when you're talking about a three minute climb, you don't need like the glycogen stores are not going to be a limiting factor. So you don't need to glycogen load but the watts per kilogram are going to matter a lot. So while you might want to do it, I think it's not the best idea because you don't want that extra weight um, on you. Whereas if yeah. you're doing a longer climb, let's say one hour, 20 minutes, well, I've seen people deplete completely glycogen stores in one hour, 20 minutes. So perhaps you actually want to basically fill up the glycogen stores completely for the, such a climb. Yeah. But so it's really like type of... Uh, you need to like think about the nutrition in in that way because of course um, we we store water with with glycogen as well so that's where some of that that weight comes from too yeah so one of the things that no two of the things that i would definitely be doing irrespective of what type of a climb it is is i would go with a strictly low fiber and low sodium diet in days leading to the actual event so low fiber three days and low sodium probably like at least one day prior um the actual event so why low fiber well fiber is kind of a carbohydrate that doesn't really get properly digested so you basically fill up the intestines and this is what you actually end up pooping out um on the toilet um you don't want or need to carry this extra weight um, and you can actually probably like reduce the body mass by like one kilo if you're used to like eating a lot of veggies and a lot of fiber in the diet by just reducing the amount of fiber you have two or three days before yeah sodium well it's not going to be a long event so i don't think you need to kind of have a lot of sodium a lot of um, water because sodium intake kind of causes water retention um, and you don't need that so you want to go low sodium the days before um, drink a lot of pure water to basically flush down the system um, get rid of uh, as much um, sodium as possible um, and then yeah this is kind of a, the major things and then decide whether you want to do a glycogen loading or not the day before um, and then I would probably not go like super low carbohydrate in any case, but just a normal diet or like a really high carbohydrate diet um, for like longer climbs. 
um, because you also need to consider you were going to do it in the morning the warm up, uh, which is also going to take some energy, and you want to feel good because well, feeling good usually means that you're like probably uh, fueled. Um, yeah. So definitely not risk going under fueled on a hill climb champs, um, even though that you might be like a half a kilo lighter. Um, I don't think that's like a that's functional weight um yeah. let's call it and what from a so from a carbohydrate perspective just a i suppose clarification for for some of the listeners because we live in this world and we perhaps understand some of it but for, for some people you know low fibrous foods or low fibrous car- carbohydrates are um you know not always that clear but maybe you should just name a couple of things that we can include in um you know our meals along with with protein or lean proteins that um, might satisfy some of that low carbohydrate, uh, so that low fiber approach. So, like a really good way, like of what pro- with professional cyclists we do is like, okay, let's go with a lot of rice, simple rice, perhaps tomato sauce, but not have a lot of salad, veggies around it. Um, like very simple, very simple carbs. Like um, when it comes to protein, let's not go for like a vegetable source protein, but let's go with like simple chicken, white fish, low fat, um, high protein, high quality protein, and then make sure you don't put too much salt. So definitely not have a burger the day before because it's high fat and high salt and you don't want that, but you want to do something like yeah, mm, something more simple. Um, Make sure you don't have too much parmesan, for instance, if you're having pasta or rice, because parmesan is basically like fat, protein, and a lot of um, salt. salt, which is definitely <laughs> yeah, don't, something you don't want. Um, you can load on like, I don't know, um, Haribo's or like gummy bears or something like that. It's very simple, low sodium, low fiber, it works well. Um, but yeah, you can still have a normal diet, like, for breakfast, instead of porridge oats, you have rice, um, mm-hmm. porridge rice, or can be pancakes, um, which is also like would work well. Um, with jams, when you go for them, go for the sugary ones, not the ones with a lot of fiber. Um, use a lot of syrups and stuff like that. Like this is kind of the food you will then end up having. Uh, potatoes, I think, without the skin are also fine. Um, so you have quite a few options. And, and um, I think I think an important thing that you mentioned there, which I, I find certainly working with athletes in the UK, is just a real common breakfast is porridge because we think, yeah, it's high carbohydrate, um, which, yes, but there's a, a good amount of fiber in there too. And people are quite reluctant to drift from that. And I don't know, again, whether porridge is very british thing you know a uk thing um i do see things differently in europe and and america and and the likes um and people are often reluctant to do that because they've done that for for years but actually you know approaching it a little bit different can can be quite meaningful and like you just said you know cereals like rice krispies and, and and things like that are okay in this particular situation um and i don't think we're saying that this is what we have to do all the time because yeah vegetable and fiber and things are are important but we're preparing for a specific event for a small amount of time yeah like porridge oats like it's not like just british thing like all the cyclists are having porridge oats in the morning and it's just like I get really frustrated when I tell them like, please not have porridge oats today. <laughs> you can have them every other day, but not today because it's a hilly event and like, just just don't go with rice. Um, but yeah, like most athletes and start to understand and like, it's a common practice now that yeah, you actually get rice in the morning. Um, but yeah, definitely don't like, I think, it can make a big difference and porridge oats are not the best type of a breakfast before such an event and that's just like a fact yeah yeah so yeah so depending on the duration we want to you know reduce that fiber intake um in a few days before reduce sodium the day before um and, and keep it to low fibrous foods um including so what what approach would you take for the the morning of the breakfast 
just again a, a low fiber relatively high carbohydrate approach yeah yeah definitely like make sure there are some fructose sources in there like i don't know some jams honey um, syrups um i think this is really important to keep it really simple you don't want any yeah undigested stuff and definitely not fiber because this is just going to stay in the intestine whereas if you have low fiber food the carbs will actually go into the system and then like just be stored as glycogen or used um which is functional uh but fiber is not functional in this case so yeah cool so i mean you know those are the foundations and we're gonna we're gonna talk ergogenic age which everyone gets excited about now and you know people are like oh what can i take to to help this but what we've just mentioned actually is probably gonna outweigh a lot of the you know the, the benefits from it but again we're talking marginal gains here so let's talk about ergogenic aids um of supplements as as we might want to use the term um and let's start with um bicarb and beta alanine and um you know there's an extracellular and intracellular buffers there maybe just you know explain what these do and how these can help this type of event and whether whether we should or we shouldn't use them yeah you're asking like a difficult question because i don't <laughs> think we actually know i'm not 100 percent convinced that we know how both actually improve performance but like if we leave that out and just talk about the fact that they do improve performance both improve performance seemingly like in shorter duration events or like when we're talking about like i don't know three to 15 minutes let's expand the range but keep in mind that this is like when talking about three to 15 minutes all out so for instance like in events when you have like a undulating terrain for instance like you might reduce the pace and then pick up the pace again even on longer events perhaps sodium bicarbonate could help you um so this is something to consider but if like the climb is like one hour long and it's like steady i don't think it's gonna help anyway um, yeah. but like for shorter events, like in the UK, definitely sodium bicarbonate can help a lot. And um, I think undulating events, like I, you know, I, I race mount, cross country mountain bike and yet, you know, you're going, you're fluctuating between, you know, maximal to recovery and, you know, things like that. But I suppose not detracting too far away from hill climbs, it's about the intensity that you're eliciting in which these can help yeah it's usually above the critical power so we're talking about like events that you can't like the intensity you can't sustain for a long time um and yeah this is when like these supplements work so beta alanine is a supplement you're taking for weeks before the event so you have to start thinking um yeah quite a bit in advance like now it's probably too late to start thinking about uh, beta alanine for the british hill climb championships for this year you would need to start thinking about it like i don't know in july or um even june um if you want to do benefit um yeah. but when we talk about sodium bicarbonate you want to take it on the day of the event um like two to three hours before like we discussed a, f- a few times i think um yeah. already and what um, so what would the protocol be for for um bicarb in- ingestion because I've used it myself. You've used it myself and uh, yourself and lots of other people have, but there's lots of different responses. There's been advancements in protocols over the years that do that. You know, what, what should, what is the latest, you know, what should we be doing to, to kind of maximize that? Or is that very individual? I think it's still very individual, but like as a rule of thumb, um, and I don't have myself an individual protocol, but I usually like would so would start like with taking it two hours and a half to three hours before, um, and then finish like two hours or ninety minutes before to really make sure that I get the most out of it because it needs um, some time to get absorbed, especially for shorter events. Uh, you don't want it to be still absorbed while you're doing the event. Um, so the ideal um, total amount you have is around 0.3 grams per um, kilo of body mass um so i don't know like 
around 20 grams would be for me, which is kind of a lot when you're having like the capsules. So that's why I kind of split it into multiple doses, like two times 10 with like half an hour in between or an hour in between to make it easier, drink a lot of water. And here is one of the things why you really need to go low sodium because sodium bicarbonate is sodium plus bicarbonate. So you will retain some water because of that. Um, and you need to be low in sodium so that the amount of water you will retain perhaps will make you have the same amount of water as you usually have but not more than that um, but i would probably be arguing that in most events the extra weight will not hinder the performance because you will get more out of the performance gains um, so definitely recommend it but again like it's not the best idea to try it on the race day. Try it out in training and see how it works, how you feel about it, and then decide whether you're going to use it or not. Yeah, and I think that's a real important uh, point there, which I, I was going to state as well, is that, yeah, you know, try these, try the protocol, certainly try the protocol prior, but there might be some sort of variations on that. And I know the protocol, the, the, um, we're an advocate here, and, and it's on the endurance website, is to, space that out now for anyone who hasn't had sodium bicarbonate the real issues is actually gastrointestinal issues and if we put all that in at once we may not feel so great for a period of time whereas if we space it out it just allows that to you know get through the system without overloading that bit too much and long ago back the days where you mix it with some water and <laughs> it tastes so horrible uh, it's like drinking seawater um but the, you know the capsules are working um much much better in that and that loading protocol as well to be able to um absorb that and feel okay now some people feel absolutely fine and some people it just doesn't quite agree with so going back to your point that you need to practice with it and you need to practice in the same way that you will do on the day because you know it's the nationals and you don't want to be going into that feeling you know pretty rough and then may have psychological effects on your performance yeah definitely now i know we um we mentioned beta alanine and yeah it's you know loading phase is a little bit um you know too long for um the hill climb this year but for people in the future you know what approach would we take with that I would probably like be starting to take the like loading phase, like I don't know, three, four months before, um, which is kind of like eight to ten grams per day of beta alanine, and then just like maintain with like four to five grams probably um, daily for the rest. Um, yeah. and, and anyone who the... and anyone who hasn't experienced that as well may experience the the tingles or the parathesis where. You know, it's completely safe, but you have, you know, especially if you have high doses, you can get um, this very strange pins and needles in sensation in, in your face. Um, I actually don't mind it. My other half has done it and she was like, this is crazy. I can't cope with this. <laughs> I find it. I don't mind it. Um, but yeah, there's some interesting sensations there, but that kind of wears off and again, depending on how you dose that up you might split the doses um, throughout the day or morning and evening. Um, and so finally, moving on to another ergogenic aid, which, um, which is caffeine. Now, it's not a, a cellular buffer, um, but probably the most popular um, performance enhancer um, in cycling. Now, for such a short event, do we do we really think that it can have a dramatic effect? You know, it's cardiovascular stimulus, uh, you know, lowers that perception of effort. But for such a short space of time in so much suffering, um, what's your view on that? I think it can help, but in people that are not super anxious, because... Okay. Like my personal experience is that I would get super anxious. My heart rate would be high up without taking any caffeine. So then I would be just like with caffeine starting too hard, 
feeling overconfident and just like burn uh, myself. Um, whereas like, I think to start with, you probably need to have the daily dose of caffeine, which is kind of the morning coffee. Yeah. And on the top of that, you decide whether you go with caffeine or not and how you react to it. So you definitely need some coffee in your habitual caffeine user because not having caffeine will decrease your view to max, for instance. Um, but if you w want to go more than that, like say, as an organic aid, then I would be thinking about it, whether yeah, you're super anxious or not. But if you are, then no, or a very small dose. If you don't have any kind of side problems of that, yeah, the usual recommendations, like 20, 30 minutes before the start, um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, um, what are those? Are they two to three milligrams per kilo? Yeah, yeah. One to three, I would say, like... Depending on your response. Yeah. Because, yeah, I know it's interesting and either... I, it's another thing where there are responders and, and I wouldn't say non-responders, but it doesn't have so much of a, an effect on um, and over longer durations and the likes that can that can help um, in, in many different ways. But for such a, a short event, it, it's very interesting of, of how that can can really support that. Now, I've got a really interesting question for you, and I think just in general, the, the, certainly the literature, the consensus within the academic side of things. Um, and just thinking a little bit on the physiology, perhaps how some of these such short, intense um, races happen, there might be some kickers, etc. is could we consider whether it's a small or a large dose, uh, the use of creatine? Um, because, you know, creatine, it supports the, the phosphocreatine system. Um, again, something that is reserved for very short, high intensity, um, intensity efforts like, you know, sprints. But we're working at a, a very high workload here. There's going to be, it's not black and white around what energy systems contribute. And let's say, you know, reading the hill climb this morning, there's a 14% kick right at the end of this or, you know, at some part in there where we just need to muscle over that. What's your view on that? Yeah, it's a tough one. And I just keep changing my opinion whether like to recommend um, creating to riders I work with. Um, and like whenever I tried, it didn't really work super well. So I'm basically not recommending creatine at the moment to anyone but i know colleagues working in professional cycling teams that are big fans of creatine and have good success with it so honestly i don't really know but looking at the evidence it perhaps would make sense but i feel like the individual differences are massive um, and it really depends on what kind of a rider you are. So, for example, I would be guessing that for a rider that is really good at doing 30 minute climb or one hour, one hour, 20 minute climbs and wants to do a hill climb championships that is like two to three minutes, he will probably lack explosivity. Um, and this is when creating could be helpful. But for somebody that is already very good at these short events, which means that they're very explosive, they have a really high W prime, so anaerobic capacity. I don't think this will add much and might actually lead to weight gain because these riders usually already have quite a bit of muscle mass as compared to like climbers for longer events. Because with, this... yeah, the thing to note as well is that with creatine, we get water retention as well. And there are some differences out there that if you go down the bodybuilding side, you know, there's a large dose and there's you know some weight gain and water retention there along with with strength um benefits but that you know when it gets to the endurance world it's like there's nuances and there's micro dosing it and all this kind of thing that people are, are trying um to do there but i know this is a very gray area and we don't really know enough information about that but it's interesting what you say about the different physiology types and and how, how they might respond. Um, and do you think, another interesting question just off the back of that as well is, do you think that there might be differences in people's nutritional preferences? 
um, you know, and their, their dietary preferences on on whether that will will benefit them or not. Yeah, I mean, you definitely need to try everything out anyway. So, like, not having porridge or just for that particular day is not gonna like, yeah, not gonna be great. And some people like really like to have feeling of high glycogen level. So I don't know. There, like when I was preparing for the time trials, at, like races like Tour de France or Vuelta with the riders, sometimes they would go with like super high like carbohydrate intake before, and I was like, no, 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 it doesn't make a lot of sense because mm -hmm. well, it's a uphill and you don't need that much weight. But yeah. they would like, yeah, but it's really important, um, and they would do the pro proper glycogen loading. So it's like also a mental thing. Uh, to consider so that's definitely like something you want to try out uh, mm -hmm. because the evidence is very clear you don't need a lot of glycogen for reinforced efforts that are shorter than 15 minutes yeah. that's like black and white but yeah. how this then affects your perceived effort is a different story but i think uh, i suppose more the, the avenue i was going down is you know it relates a little bit to our um previous podcast but you know you might have meat eaters, vegetarians, vegans, which then will have varying degrees of um, you know, creatine um, associated with those and whether actually someone who's vegetarian, who doesn't have that baseline, you know, intake that others, I mean, we don't know enough about it. It's just, you know, a subjective <laughs> speculation. Um, you know, it's just an interesting um, avenue. Yeah, but I honestly like, yeah, I never tried uh, creating myself and real like the experience I had with riders, like they gained weight, they didn't gain power and um, yeah, everyone was just annoyed with the decision to go for it. Um, yeah. So yeah, this is like my experience. But so so no said, for the hill climb. Yeah, I, the highest, yeah, I would probably wouldn't go for it. <laughs> um so so there we go so i i suppose just to recap that little section because i just want to talk about um we've got some very specific hill climb there but i actually want to go and talk about koms or, or qoms um and and some of the differences but just to touch on on you know the the uk hill climb scene um you know really we we will glycogen load depending on on the severity and duration of the climb um reduction of sodium the day before low fiber and the possibility of using bicarb or, or beta alanine in, in the right situations but all warrant some practice um prior to prior to the event let's uh let's move on because you also have some experience in in uh you know, hunting for King of the Mountains, but also, you know, we shouldn't um, disregard Queen of the Mountains because there are female listeners as well. Um, and King of the Mountain can be a bit um, a bit misleading there. But how is that different to what we see in, I know, you know, UK hills, there are people hunting for King of the Mountain, but your experience in Europe probably goes back to what we were just discussing, that, um you know the climbs tend to be much longer yeah, i mean it's not like a massive difference it's just like decide when like how you do it i think it becomes then more important when you do like these koms on your own like because you go for a km and so you need to think about the 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 weather for instance like the other day i was going up the hator like where i'm currently living around in the area um and I did the climb twice. So the first time I got there and then the second time, like a couple of weeks later. And one of the funny things was, and I like, I thought I was going better than the first time that the pay I paced is better. And I checked the results and it was like 25 seconds slower. Um, so the climb is more than 14 minutes for me. And I was like, mm, what was the power? Like what's wrong with me? And the power was to the watt the same. So basically the average power on the climb was exactly the same, but there was 25 second difference. And it was just because of the fact that the wind on that day was not ideal. Whereas on the first day when I did it, it was like very 
good for me. Yeah. Um, and like in countries like UK, where it's very windy, I think this can have a massive impact. Um, even in Europe, like it's not as important. It's, it's usually not as windy, so it's a bit better. Um, but yeah, the temperature uh, can have a massive impact as well. I remember doing, wanted to do one um, KOM in Slovenia um, in one year and I went in the morning, but it was just too hot. Like my core temperature was like skyrocketing. I was just like overheated after like 15 minutes. Then came back like a year later um, and like, yeah, smashed a KOM. Um, but it's just like all these things like need to align. Uh, yeah. Whereas when you do a hill climb championships, like kind of everyone has the same conditions. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, and I feel like it's not just nutrition then, it's just like everything that needs to align well. And it's just, yeah. Yeah, you need to be kind of smart. It, it's, uh, really. it's funny. I've um, people in the UK will know this, but um, I have Box Hill around the corner from me, which um, is not an amazing climb. It, it became famous because of the 2012 um, Olympic road race. But when it's quiet during the day, where when I can train, um, it's a nice smooth road, and it's a, between a five and six minute climb. Um, and I actually have my fastest time up that is actually on my mountain bike <laughs> and not on my road bike. And, uh, you know, you could argue that my mountain bike's lighter than my road bike because it's a winter training bike. But, uh, but actually that day, you know, I was doing some intervals uh, and I just continued it to the tops. It was, you know, 20, 30 seconds off. And I was, I was just amazed that, yeah, I was on my mountain bike, but it, it must've been a wind direction thing. And, could be a bit of, of temperature come to play there but yeah you would think that they would be quite dramatically different but they weren't <laughs> so if for you know for the listeners out there if they're thinking about some of this stuff and they want to have a go at KOM and I'm guessing that we would approach it exactly the same apart from what we want to consider is that glycogen loading part of it if we really want to try do it outside of you know pacing and environment and things like that from a nutritional perspective we want to be thinking about those days before um you know that reduction of sodium low fiber perhaps some ergogenic aids on on the on the morning or the day before but if these are going to be long climbs like you say we want an element of glycogen loading prior to that but if it's short then not so much yeah Would you say that that's pretty much that's the recipe for hill climbing yeah, I would say so. Like, this is how I was approaching the climbs when I was still obsessive with KOMs, especially in Slovenia. Like, it was basically a race day for me. Like, I'd made sure that the yeah, fiber was low, everything was like kind of perfect. I looked at the, the weather for the day, tried to find a time when like the temperature was fine, and like, yeah, he tried to get the pacing right. Um, Ideally, the weather conditions in terms of the wind align uh, because you definitely don't want a headwind um, because you will get really frustrated, like <laughs> really frustrated. Yeah, for sure. Because like it happened to me a few times, I would go for it and I would be like, yes, I'm going to get it and then come home like 20 seconds lower. And I'm like, why? Look at the power. Oh, it's higher. And did I gain weight? No, 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 no. no. It's, it's just the winds. Just relax. It's the wind. Um, and then you're annoyed with yourself because you made a big effort for nothing. Um, so weather is really important here. Which we all know it can just change in a moment in the UK. So good luck to, to everyone hunting for those in the UK. Yeah, we need to start a podcast with weather and a finish it with better and that's it. Tim and Alex so. weather show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I think that's a perfect place to to wrap it up there, actually. And um, hopefully there's some great knowledge there that the listeners can go out and, and try work out for themselves. Um, we wish everyone um, good luck at the, the British or the UK National um, Hill Climb Champs uh, next month. And um, yeah, enjoy riding. Thank you. I'll see um, you soon. Bye. Ciao. Thank mm-hmm. you.